Hello, I would like to welcome you to our panel session today entitled Setting the Stage, Why Should and How Can Accounting and Finance Faculty Become Involved, in, basically in the whole area of sustainability. I'm Robert Neckel, I'm Distinguished Professor and Frederick Fisher, Eminent Scholar at the University of Florida and the current Senior Editor of the Accounting Review. We have a very impressive panel lined up here uh, who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, each of whom has a unique perspective on this issue and is more than willing to share. Uh, before we get into that, though, the goal of this session is essentially to encourage a next generation of young scholars to develop research and teaching interests in the area of sustainability. And from a broad set of different perspectives, be it accounting, reporting, investing, assurance, government policy, or regulation, the subject of, of sustainability is critical especially today, and our students and future, and particularly for our students and future generations of academic scholars. Basically, the idea here is that sustainability can open a whole bunch of doors for young scholars and their research and their teaching interests. And that's the whole point of this session. The issues that arise from the study of sustainability are inherently multidisciplinary. But the current structure of our business schools makes it a bit difficult to pursue some of these issues, either programmatically or from a research point of view. And so we're hoping that the program in general and this panel will help indicate ways that we can all get involved in looking at sustainability issues. The goal is, again, to foster, facilitate, and encourage high quality and impactful work in the area of sustainability. So let us turn to our three panelists. We have Gerben Duzwart, who is the head of investment solutions at APG Asset Management in the Netherlands. He will speak from an investing point of view. We have Professor Roberto Rigobone, who is the Society of Sloan Fellows Professor of Management and Professor of Applied Economics at MIT in Boston. He will speak more from a measurement perspective. And then we have Professor Roger Simnet, who's a member of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board and Scientia Professor Emeritus of Accounting at the University of New South Wales in Australia. So we'll take those, they each have some open remarks. We will start with Gerben in just a second. After each of the panelists have had a few minutes to make some preliminary remarks, I will come back and we will begin a series of questions and answers that will hopefully illustrate a lot of these issues in a lot more detail. So Gerben, I'm gonna call on you to start our discussion off if you'd be so kind. Thank you, Robert. Well, my perspective is a European asset owner perspective. Uh, we manage the assets of four Dutch pension funds with a total of about 600 billion euros assets under management. And our ambition is to be a leading, responsible and a sustainable investor, as I also outlined in my previous keynote speech. So what I stressed is the clear trend of the growing integration of sustainability and ESG in pension fund investment portfolios. And the number of pension funds integrating sustainability in their investments is growing. And at the same time, the bar is raised by pension funds that are already integrating sustainability in their investment uh, portfolios. So this is really a topic very close at my heart. During the keynote, I introduced the dimensions that we look at from a sustainable and responsible investment perspective. And that's a quite a long list. So what I discussed is we look at climate risk. We look at the carbon footprint of the portfolio. We have exclusions in our portfolio like tobacco, cluster ammunition. The sustainable development goals are very important uh, for our clients. They target to have 20% of their assets under management invested in investments that contribute to the sustainable development goals by 2025. And ESG, environment, social and governance. We only want to invest in leaders and we will engage with companies that lack leadership and we think they can step up on sustainable and responsibility. So that's a long list of dimensions that we target. And that's also the dimensions that we incorporate in our investment proposals. So 
that brings me at my issue, my key points, and that's measurements. So basically, what is crucial for investors? That is measurements and data. And that's also where we're looking at you, the young researchers, and we try to convince you to contribute in this field. And the impact, that's very significant because basically we need your research to make better investment decisions. So indirectly, you will influence the capital allocations to green firms or to firms that are less green uh, by supporting investors. At the same time, um, we want to track and to measure over time uh, the sustainability profile of the investments, but also the impact of the uh, sustainability of our uh, investments. So how many lives are saved when you make an investment in a biotech firm because you think it can lead to a better world? Or how much carbon reduction will you generate when you invest in electric cars? Just to name a few. Here I will stop because I already gave you my keynote speech for 30 minutes. So Robert, the floor is back to you. Hey, Gervin, we will be hearing more from Gervin's as we go through our Q&A, but now I'd ask Roberto to uh, provide some brief introductory comments. So thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me and, um, and thank you so much for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me to the conference. Let me say uh, that when I think about what are the three biggest challenges that, that we as a species face uh, are the way we treat the environment and the ecosystem, the way we treat each other, and the way we treat ourselves. Issues of mental health, issues of income inequality, discrimination, and issues about how we are destroying the environment uh, are first of the issues. In fact, if we don't change our behavior, I'm pretty sure we're going to be disappearing as a species uh, with probability one. So uh, in order to solve those incredibly big challenges, uh, uh, we need to actually be able to understand what are the true facts and what is the impact of our actions and, 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 and to also evaluate performance of the ones that are doing properly and the ones that are not doing that uh, well. Uh, we can do that without measurement. We, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's impossible to make a decision in this area if we don't understand uh, better measurement. This is important for the financial sector, sector as Gerben has said. This is important for people that are trying to find jobs in companies that their values coincide with their personal values. Uh, this is important for, uh, for providers and suppliers. This is important for regulators. It's important for customers. So we need to provide uh, data to all those constituencies, uh, to the people that finance the companies, to the people that are going to decide to work on the companies, uh, to the customers that are going to buy the products from those co uh, companies, in such a way that we, as a whole world community, can make better decisions. Uh, research here is incredibly lagging. So we are incredibly, incredibly late. We understand the damage we're producing. We don't understand how to fix it properly. And we don't understand how to measure that impact properly. Now, we cannot continue in this way. Life for Gerben is incredibly difficult to understand how to actually make those investments in a way that is meaningful. Uh, we need our researchers, and you, all of you, have a very important role to play into that. So it's producing the data and organizing the data in such a way that that uh, we can make better decisions. So I think this is a first order challenge that we have in the world. We have always solved the problems by measuring properly. So I think it's time that we do that for issues about governance, about the social impact, about inclusion and about the environment. So this is my challenge to all of you. There's a lot of work to be done. We will move on now and let Roger have a few comments and then we'll circle back and begin a series of questions and answers. So Roger. Thanks, Robert. And uh, like Roberto, I'm very excited to be part of this panel. It, uh, it is an important uh, part going forward. I'll talk from the perspective of a standard set of regulator, um, as well as an academic. Uh, as a member of the IAASB, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, the views I'm expressing are not the views of the board, they're, the, they're my own views. So you'll get those there. Um, a few opening remarks. As a standard setter, our, our overriding consideration is public interest. Uh, so we're trying to serve the public interest. Uh, definitely a public interest area here. And uh, so uh, it's important that we get involved. As we've heard from Gerben, there is a continual demand for high quality, relevant, reliable information. So we're trying to meet that. 
but we know, as we've heard from Roberto, that there are a lot of measurement challenges here. And so uh, we, we need to address that. Uh, as academics, uh, you will be using information which comes from a framework, in most cases comes from a reporting framework. Um, and those reporting frameworks at the moment are under continuous improvement. Uh, so they're at various stages of, uh, of maturity. So it is important that we be involved here uh, and that we, we judge those as academics, we are trained to uh, to work on these particular areas. Uh, we are independent, uh, and so it's important that we are heavily involved in this particular area. I do believe that what gets measured uh, and gets reported gets managed. Uh, so, uh, so I see a big benefit there. And also, as Gerben said, uh, what gets reported externally gets relied upon by external stakeholders, uh, which leads to resource allocation decisions. So these are very important areas. And as Roberto said, if we don't do something, um, you know, we could be facing uh, extinction in, in a number of, of years. So it's important that we do areas. I'll talk through just a couple of areas uh, that are important. Uh, first is the reporting frameworks and related measurement rules and disclosures. We, there's a huge range of reporting frameworks out there. So there's over 400 reporting frameworks out there. And so it's a, it's a myriad of, uh, of, of reports that we can be working through uh, from, uh, from very specific information to covering a broad range of information. The reporting frameworks are fractured. And so they're at a very evolutionary stage. And we need research in there on all these different types of reporting frameworks. Some of them are principled, uh, which means they outline an objective, and some are very procedures based, which means they will outline very much um, the way you measure and the way you disclose. And that's a ch challenge for us. We've talked about the importance of measurement, but if we get it wrong, we can make wrong decisions on that on that particular basis. Uh, so as a regulator, we are we are balancing these things as a as a person developing frameworks. The precision of, of, uh, of the measurement is also important uh, in these particular areas. And so we can set very, as I said, set very detailed measurement standards uh, and, and disclosure standards, uh, but they will not necessarily apply to all the types of situations. And they might result in incorrect conclusions, which will lead to incorrect decision-making, which is what we can't afford. So again, we have to be very careful there as regulators and we do it. Um, and in these areas, we've got a few challenges, which includes the areas of materiality. How do we set materiality here? Because we have not common units of currency and also aggregation risk. So how do we deal with those particular areas? As well as the reporting frameworks, uh, we also then have uh, areas of, uh, of how we go about making sure this information is credible. And so that relates to uh, the credibility enhancing mechanisms, including uh, including the, the, the role of assurance. So there are a range of credibility enhancing mechanisms. And again, we, we need evidence on what are the best ones. Most of these are voluntary. Some of these are becoming mandatory, uh, as we see. And so we have a range of discretions and disclosures. If you're applying economic theory, this is a great area for applying economic theory because all you're seeing at the moment is done usually on a demand and supply. Uh, so people are supplying this information because they leave it's beneficial and they're demanding it. So, so it's a great area to be for. So like everybody else, I'll emphasise this is a great area to be involved with, with research. There's lots of interesting research questions. I'm sure some of them will come out as we start to explore these. Uh, and, uh, and it's an exciting area. So with those introductory remarks, I'll pass back to you, Robert. Thank you, Roger. So, well, I don't think there's much disagreement even before we started this, that sustainability is critical, time sensitive, and basically huge. This whole issue is going to drive, I think, what we do as investors, educators, accountants, uh, for the foreseeable future. So what I'd like to do now is throw out a couple, throw out a question. We're going to start with Gerben. Now he's just done a the plenary. So uh, he may have a few new things to add to that, but also it's to also allow the other panelists to possibly react to some of the things that Gerben has to say. So Gerben, here's what I'd like to ask you. 
As an active manager of pension fund investments, how do you see sustainability reporting influencing your decisions? What information do you tend to use now? And what would you like to see in the future as we improve uh, the various things that Roger just mentioned, the frameworks and the measurements? And how important is it for organizations to develop a consistent reporting framework that you might be able to compare across organizations and across time? Yeah, these are three uh, good questions, uh, Robert. Uh, let me tackle the first question uh, first. So we see that sustainability reporting is influencing our investment decisions. So let's take a step back and look at how we take our investment decisions. And there we make each investment decision uh, by balancing three dimensions. Or, and basically the dimensions are uh, expected returns, risk, the cost of an investment, and the ESG or the sustainability profile of an investment. And that's a balance between these four dimensions. So it means that our ideal investments gives you a high return, a low risk, and is very green. But these investments are very scarce. So that means that every day we need to balance these four dimensions and we need a lot of the information related to that. And that's not only in listed equity, but it's also in corporate bonds. It's also in direct real estate, but it's also in hedge funds or private equity. Um, so that's across all our asset classes. Then on the second question, um, what kind of information do we use today and what kind of information do we want to use going into the future? Today, we just use self-reported data and we use information from the ESG rating agencies. But going forward and, and already a little bit today, I see two important trends. So one is the use of other third-party data. So call them alternative data providers. So data providers not related to company reporting itself, but independent data, for example, from the governance, from NGOs, uh, news sources, and the aim of the use of that data is to get a more holistic perspective on sustainability of a company than only using self-reported data. And in addition, there is a clear trend on measuring the impact of the decision what I already previously mentioned. So we want to know if we make an investment because of the sustainability, what is the impact on the environment or on the climate from that investment? And that's what we want to measure over time. So not only as a one-off, but really how do we make a difference? So that's a whole new dimension. And then the consistency across asset management companies. In the preparations, I labeled that question as important, but not urgent. So I think from the previous panel had the climate action that's needed, that's really urgent and that will change the investments. And I think the next step, and that's definitely important, it's about how asset managers, how asset owners, pension funds start to report about the sustainability profile of their investment portfolios. And given the overwhelming amount of data that's already available, I'm fully aware that it's very difficult to compare the sustainability profile of one pension fund with the other. And we have taken a small step. So about five years ago, we acquired a data science company uh, to help us to measure and classify listed equity companies if they contribute to the sustainable development goals, yes or no. And after acquiring a team from Deloitte of 15 data scientists, we had an internal discussion. Should we keep that team confidential in our company or should we set a global standard and contribute to the society by providing this data to all pension funds, to asset owners, just to make the exposure comparable? And we choose for the last option and we launched the asset owner platform together with PGGM, the Australian super, and the Canadian PCI. So with these four pension funds, we launched that platform, just providing information on the sustainable development goals classification of companies to help and contribute of a consisting reporting in this field. And this is where I give back the word to you, uh, Robert. Thank you.
Thank you, Gerben. Do would a, either of the other panelists like to follow up on this? So I, I would like to add a little bit about the consistency, uh, also about the data providers, the data, uh, the, the the need for consistency in certain areas. I think that that we have to start thinking about uh, ESG uh, data as an ethical aspect of the firms. And, and, and it's not a matter of opinion about stock returns. And therefore, uh, if I am gonna uh, evaluate a company and, and I am going to say that they are using child labor in their production or the supply chain, that's not a matter of, of opinion. That's a very uh, important accusation. And that, so that has legal repercussions. So this is different than just uh, opinion. Most people always ask me, uh, do we need to have consistency across the rating agencies and the evaluations of these companies? And I said, well, it depends on what the issue is. And this, it, we have to go to the ethics uh, to be a guidance about this. There are some areas in which this is not a matter of discussion, that if we find evidence of misbehavior, then we should take actions. And it's more than, than I don't want to oversimplify what Gerben is doing. It's not only about what finance should do, it's about what law enforcement should do in some, on some of these areas. So I think that it's also important, not only consistency across financial institutions that are using the data, but also consistency across some of these areas from the data providers. And therefore, in this sense, transparency, what Gerben is suggesting is actually very good. I will encourage rating agencies to, in, in certain areas, to be equally transparent because we're all measuring different pieces of, for example, human trafficking. We will be much better off uh, if we all share those pieces uh, to be able to construct a true assessment about the probability of using human trafficking, production of one company, textile or not, whatever it is. And the same for uh, safety of products. So I want to emphasize the issue of consistency from the measurement point of view that is, uh, is also needed. Back to you, Robert. I'll come in and then we might give Gerben a, a chance to reply. Uh, look, again, consistency can be um, can be guaranteed, I suppose, or, or can't be guaranteed, but it, it can be encouraged uh, through the, the precision in the reporting frameworks. But as you get more precise in this diverse information, um, it may lead to the types of measurement errors that Roberto was talking about before. Um, so uh, we try to aim at comparability uh, to allow uh, resource. Uh, most, most frameworks try to aim at co comparability, but there's also in these frameworks, there is a, an area of developing um, continuous improvement. So even they, they will, will, will struggle on comparability. Um, I agree entirely with both speakers that uh, the more transparency we can have around these things, the better. Um, but we do aim comparability, and sometimes it's not comparability across, it's, uh, across, it's across periods within the same organisation because of the, the range, as well as a comparability between what organisations you might have to allocate resources to or, or wish to allocate resources to. So these are challenges that lead to research questions, which is which is great. Uh, and uh, and they research questions which need to be addressed. Um, and also for Gerben, you know, he, he talked about sustainable development goals. That's one framework. There are many frameworks out there as well. Uh, and, and and Gerben actually talked about a number of frameworks coming in here. So he's got he's got the challenge of balancing all these things across a number of different frameworks and measurement criteria as well as trying to establish how credible this information is. So when you get it from your data aggregator or whoever, what are the credibility enhancing? Both of those things can be encouraged by transparency and disclosures. And if we see those, they give a rise to reporting opportunities. So I'll pass back to you, Robert, on those comments. Okay, Roger, thank you. Gerben, do you have anything to add to this at this point? Yeah, I think uh, Roberto and Roger both uh emphasized or, or confirmed uh, the consistency and also the challenges in the consistency. And just to add a final dimension uh, that was not discussed is the historical consistency. So uh, for academic research, very often you need historical data sets. And because of the dynamics that were mentioned and, and the evolving insights that we have, uh, most of the data sets, uh, even from the rating agencies, the ESG rating agencies, they lack consistency in their historical data sets. So what's our solution is try to get the information as detailed as possible. So don't rely on the overall aggregated score, but really try the indicators like uh, Robert, uh, Roberto mentioned, uh, an indicator for child labor or any other indicator and really build up 
your own ESG rating framework internally based on very detailed data. And it, that's our approach to get as reliable as possible uh, scores. But I think this also shows how interesting this field is and how much work needs to be done. So back to you, Robert. Well, I think your final point there is actually very interesting because I'm not sure that with 100 years of accounting research, we still know what the appropriate level of aggregation is for a financial statement. And now we're moving into a brave new world where we cannot even rely upon uh, dollar or currency denominated numbers that can be aggregated easily. And so I think this is going to this is a great area for uh, future research to look at. Uh, I actually have a pretty simple question, though, Gervin, before we move on to Roberto. Uh, would you prefer freestanding sustainability reports or would you prefer to see a fully integrated approach to, to reporting? I lack the expertise to give an answer to that. So what I just stress is that I need reliable information that's widely available. And for me, it's the data that that I need. And, and the way how it's reported, I leave that to the experts uh, like Roger uh, to answer that question. Okay, good answer. <laughs> okay, Roberto, if you don't mind stepping up, uh, given the desire for better sustainability reporting as we've just been highlighting with Gerben's comments, what do you see as the role of the current and more importantly, the future state of the art for measurement technology related to the issues we're talking about? Uh, are there some good things we have going now that we can build on or do we really need to look to the future to develop whole new methodologies? So this, this also builds a little bit on the, on, on your comment, Robert, about uh, uh, accounting has spent a hundred years measuring one thing, uh, earnings, okay? <laughs> so uh, in, in, in sustainability, we're gonna move to measure 64 things and we only have uh, 10 years uh, of experience. So so this is a uh, You sure it's only 64, by the way? Uh, well, I mean, it's just, I, I made up a number. <laughs> Actually, 64 <laughs> is from our paper. So, um, yeah. So uh, I think the two things are gonna happen. So we are in the process of developing a lot of these measurements. So uh, we are kind of also discovering what matters to us. So, uh, and I learn every day when I talk to, to people at MIT about things that matter to them. So, you know, if you ask me, I never cared about electromagnetic field pollution, but it happens to be that this is a thing uh, in Germany, so, <laughs> in the Netherlands. And so they, they care a lot about this. So, so the issue is that we are also learning what our preferences are. So we don't even know how to do the trade-off. So, Unfortunately, uh, we will need to have a kind of competition on the data providers because I think it's the best way to produce the innovation of the new measurements uh, moving ahead. And, and that will imply that it will be very difficult to create histories of measurements, that it will be very difficult to compare through time. It's going to make the life of Roger absolutely miserable. I understand that. Uh, because it would be impossible to compare today to uh, three weeks ago. And, uh, and I think that if we have enough research, at the beginning, that competition will, will feel very disorganized, but it, it, we have the chance to produce better measurements. I think that we have the technologies to do that uh, from, from alternative data sources to web scraping to, um, to sensors that we can deploy. And as, and as we provide all of those uh, and we try all of those uh, techniques, we will be able to measure ourselves a little bit better, more timely. Uh, uh, less reliant on self-reporting, and um, and in in some sense we will be able to to produce better measurement. But unfortunately, the bad consequence of that uh, is that if lucky, we will have uh, two years of data. So I mean, so the the comparability through time is going to be very very difficult. Um, I do think that a lot of ha things are happening, especially on social issues, which are I think uh, are very difficult to measure. Governance is a little bit simpler. Uh, I think we have a little bit more agreement, but on social issues, uh, people are becoming very creative using technology to evaluate how we discriminate, how we talk to each other, how to interrupt each other, etc. So I've seen a uh, very interesting research uh, on that and also on environment uh, uh, and, and all the aspects from water to soil quality. Um, uh, I have seen many, many sensors being deployed that are helping a lot. So, so I do think that this is a area in which is very multidisciplinary. You will need to learn a little bit of artificial intelligence or machine learning. You will need to learn a little bit about economics and understand the incentives. And you will need to learn something about the subject that you are measuring. 
and, and, and all of those three areas put together, we will be able to solve one, one of these measurement problems at a time. Uh, but I do think that we will have a, a disorganized process. If we are successful, it has to be very disorganized. So unfortunately, that's the drawback of that. Roger, would you like to add anything? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you've, you create such an interesting challenge here, Roberto. Uh, I suppose I come from an accounting and finance background um, and, and we're used to dollars uh, and the precision of dollars. And it's been an interesting area for me as I move into sustainability and, and greenhouse gases, uh, for example, uh, and, and the types of measurement techniques. Uh, um, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a challenge in that, you know, your background is challenged uh, as, as an academic. Um, but it's an exciting area because it brings a whole lot of measurement techniques uh, that, that we haven't thought about because, you know, this is a scientific and, and physical qualities uh, that we're looking at here uh, and 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 bringing them over in these particular areas. So I, I, I think there's lots of opportunities here. The, the aggregation, as you say, is huge and the aggregation risk, um, which leads to errors, um, you know, and, you know, we're not getting the offsets right and the externalities in this type of data are huge and we need to uh, and we need to have approaches at, at identifying this. We have challenged it before within the financial and just to broaden that out uh, into some of these challenges into this broader areas, I think is is a great area. Uh, but as you say, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're trained and we're, we're properly doing this stuff because we don't want bad, bad research. We want good research, which is going to inform us. Uh, so everybody's going to be trained. So... Just, it's just comments more than anything else, Robert, at the moment, rather than a question for Roberto. Gerben, anything to add? Yeah, Roberto, I would like to add one dimension, and that's the timeliness. So I think there is a big difference between financial or accounting information and the sustainability information. And I just want to give you an example how important it is. And I would like to think about a utility company, a utility company that has its revenues 50% from clean energy, and 50% from uh, carbon-fueled uh, power generators. And in, from our perspective, that's not a green company. But imagine that this utility company is selling its uh, carbon-power-fueled uh, 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 installations, and it's only a green energy company afterwards. We can't afford to wait for two or one or two years to have this reported in our data sets because that's that's normally the reporting time. So Roberto, I'm very curious on your thoughts on timeliness, given your perspective and everything that you mentioned before. This is like what happens when I go to the doctor and, uh, and she tells me, which has been the same doctor for 22 years, she tells me that I'm one year older, that I'm losing hair and <laughs> that I have gained half a pound. I mean, after one year, <laughs> I just have regret for two weeks. It's very difficult to actually uh, correct your health uh, by only paying attention to the past and only measuring very infrequently. I need something like this that actually tells me, you know, how I'm actually exercising every day and how my impact is uh, affecting my life every single day. The same happened. You are absolutely correct. It, it, this is about ethical behavior. So this is about what is the probability that something will happen in the future. So understanding in, the, in your example of the utility function, what is the probability that it becomes clean in two years is extremely important for you as an investor. It's incredibly important for people that will be working in that company. And it would be incredibly important for customers that are going to be buying those products. So understanding that path, but it doesn't have to be certain. Okay, it doesn't have to be like a 100% chance in two years. But give you a probabilistic statement. There's a 75% chance that this company will go through the right path. Is that acceptable or not? And if it's so, we would be able to make better decisions. We need to learn how to make decisions on this massive amount of uncertainty. That's another part that I, that I, I people in finance like Gerben do that every single day. I, I don't think that we normal citizens um, uh, understand how to manage that uncertainty. So, so we will need to learn uh, with that uncertainty because the data by itself is going to be very noisy. Uh, we're making like judgments every day about firms and it, we should make judgments about the past, but what is truly important is to make judgments about the future. And we need to do that more than once a year. It, it, it cannot happen once a year. It's impossible 
to, to understand how to make decisions if you measure yourself uh, so infrequently. Again, it happens to all of us. Uh, as we get older, uh, we, we realize always very late uh, uh, why, why we should have actually behaved better when we were 25. Uh, so, uh, so back to you, Robert. That's a very good yeah, question. I, have a, I, I actually have a follow-up question to this. Um, with, you said 64 different metrics, um, none of which are going to be in a common unit of measure, I presume. Uh, how do you set priorities? I mean, as to what you do today, what you do next week, what you do in six months. And do you foresee that some of these metrics could actually lead to very difficult uh, trade-offs, for lack of a better word? And you know, we deal with those kind of issues when we don't have a common measurement system. Two things. We are, so, so let me answer the trade-offs first. We are already making those choices, Robert. I mean, implicitly in the society, we're already making those choices. We're making these choices now based on the arrogance that only ignorance provides. So we delegate the responsibility on some, you know, uh, <laughs> you know a politician that decides what to do with an incredible degree of ignorance. And so we are making those choices today. So if we have better data, even if we have different unit of account, at least we will be able to understand what the trade-offs imply. So, so, so when India is making choices about growth rate of their country and, you know, Peru is making choices about, you know, how to do the lockdown in COVID, they are making those very difficult choices, but with an incredibly high degree of ignorance. So, so it, it would be better to actually have some data to at least guide. Maybe we, 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 should, we, should, keep in, we should keep in mind that no choice is also a choice. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly. Choice. No, exactly. Not acting is also, is, is also uh, a choice. So, but, but I do think that uh, we also need to understand to whom this data should uh, uh, point. So we don't understand the preferences of our investors. Um, and, and for the moment, the rating agencies are doing a very good job trying to capture what, uh, what the citizens want in some sense, what the citizens value. But it will be important to actually understand what the true values are. So at MIT, for example, we're trying to do uh, that estimation. Is we have a, 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 in the aggregate confusion project, we have something called the ESG machine, which is an app that you put on the phone. And then you actually play a game uh, where actually you will estimate your own preferences. So, so how much, if you have to allocate money between two conflicting uh, uh, a, a social objectives, how will you choose between that? And by the way, what we have done is to realize that we are incredibly different, incredibly, incredibly different. Uh, depending on your age, depending on your nationality, depending on your own experiences, we're incredibly different. So how to aggregate and make those choices is something that I don't have an answer, but we better at least first estimate how different and how similar we are. Um, so let me say something about that, because this is very important area of research in, in economics and, and social choice. Every time I have asked for preferences from very large groups of people, I get two things. One, we are super different in the sense of what is important for some individuals. Some will like more civil rights, someone will like more environment, someone will like uh, more product safety, etc. But what is truly amazing is irrespective of what you want to emphasize, everybody wants to take care of everything. So, so those are two things. So we are similar in the aspect that all these 64 issues matter uh, to people, all, all of them, tooling. You, you will not put a zero in any place. That's the whole point I want to say. You want to improve on all of them. We just want to, prior, the priorities might be different. And that we have to find a way to make those choices. But there, at least in my view, what is very important is that we have agreement of what are the problems we have to fix. We just have too many. So therefore, let's solve the problems, you know, <laughs> you know, decide a way to, to determine that priority. But we need to first understand what, what are the priorities of people, the people and, and the workers. So, it, so that, that would be my aim. So back to you, Robert. Well, that's basically the whole field of political economics, right? Trying to figure out how to set these priorities. Okay, uh, Roger, your turn. Um, Basically, uh, I want to refer to a recent article in the Harvard Business Review, which essentially has argued that the hype of sustainability reporting has sur surpassed the reality. 
uh, Roberto and others, and you all have made some comments about measurement issues and measurement technology, uh, and whether the, 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 the technology exists to provide high quality measures at, the, at this point. Um, how do you think we could make sustainability reporting more reliable, right? How, do, how much do you think the ability to assure sustainability information depends on advances in these technologies? And how much value do current assurance models provide when it comes to this type of information? Thanks, Robert. Uh, look, uh, that was a fascinating article. So I would recommend everybody to have a look at that uh, article in the Harvard Business Review in the May issue 2021. Um, look, at, at, this is a, a quickly evolving area and, and the author had challenged us as to, uh, you know, with, and, and some of my basic premise, um, you know, does what gets measured gets managed? Uh, and uh, so, uh, because they're saying we, we don't seem to be solving the world's problems now. And I understand it. So if you take this from a, a world's perspective, uh, we aren't solving climate change at the moment. We're not solving poverty. We're not solving these these broad issues. And the sustainability reporting we're talking about is, uh, you know, the unit of measurement is back, back at the organisational level. So they're the ones producing the sustainability reports. And, and that's for a, and these are for problems as Roberto's talking about, which are societal problems. So they're not back in an individual organization. We hope that as we help organizations do better in these areas, that that will benefit society and we'll get better resource allocation decisions. Uh, I, I, so the, the author has challenged us on the basis of, you know, does sustainability reporting solve these types of problems? Uh, because they are global issues, um, it is hard to think of those particular areas because of the measurement problems and the aggregation problems. And because we're a resource constrained world and we're still rewarding people for growth, economic growth, uh, as distinct from reducing carbon footprints. Uh, so, uh, so, for example, there's a lot of trade offs here and we just need to do, do work. And and you get basically got to have to work out who are the stakeholders and what priorities do they do in order to do that. So I think it challenges sustainability reporting, but it, sustainability reporting has a role, not necessarily to solve those things, but to make those organisations more accountable for the resources that they are using. Uh, and so as we develop those areas, uh, I think, uh, you know, that uh, that's a that's a, an admirable role uh, and an important one that we take forward in those particular areas. Will it solve society's problems? They are bigger and we have to work out that there are, we have to work at the country level, we have to work at, these are international problems, we have to work at the international uh, level as well. So there's a whole lot of levels there. We need, to the other part of your question, Robert, we need credible information. So we need information we can rely on for these decisions. Um, and it's interesting, uh, as I, you know, listen to Gerben, who talks about um, aggregation and disaggregation, you know, we report, we aggregate information to try and put it into a form which is usable. Um, and, and, and an assurance report is also of that form. But I, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of different credibility enhancement techniques uh, that are of interest here, and it's and it can range from internal audit. It can range from getting better systems and getting better data and reporting that you've got better systems and better data. It can be ranged from having better behaviours. Uh, so rather than just in the report, you know, there is a whole lot of things that we can provide information which will build confidence. In, in, in what we're trying to achieve here. So again, I think there is many, many opportunities in that particular area as people take it through. Thank you, Roger. Gerben, I'd actually like to take one thing that Roger said and ask you to remark on that. Uh, Roger made this comment about the distinction between growth as a goal versus other goals, carbon footprint being one. Uh, how does that play into your investment strategies? That's a very interesting one um, because we have been a responsible sustainable investor for many years but every time that our pension fund board wanted to step up on responsible sustainable investing we had some in discussions about who owns the performance responsibility so basically what you introduced roger is now we are 
optimizing multiple goals. So the in the old days, pension fund investing was easy because it was only about generating investment returns. And that was for the pensioners and the pension participants. But now we introduce an additional goal. So we want to pay for the pensions. And at the same time, we want to have a sustainable pension. So what will happen if I can't make the only the highest return decision because of sustainability and I take a, another decision because it balances responsibility sustainability and expected returns and then you get a lot of discussions and a, a different stream of literature and that's about the accountability of these decisions and the governance of these decisions so what we notice in practice is that there are the pension fund participants and that was uh, Roberto was already saying about his app to measure the ESG profile and the preferences. So we have 4.5 million participants. So that's a lot of different outcomes, but they contribute to the, to the focus. Then it's the pension fund board who decides on the responsible investment policy. And then it's about the, for the portfolio managers to execute a policy and incorporate it in the investment strategies. And then you get a whole discussion about benchmarking, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. Thank you. Roberto, yes, uh, I was going to ask you to chime in here. Uh, actually, before you start, there's one thing I would like to actually throw at you, which is, and it's not just Roger's comment, but I think everybody, we, we, what, as an accounting professor, I've heard a lot of things that essentially boil down to form over substance. Is, is that's a problem? And if so, how do we get past that? Again, on, on, on ethical issues, I think that both matter, form and substance. <laughs> so I think that on, on that question, I think uh, uh, we are, uh, I would like to answer like an economist as opposed uh, to an engineer. So let me answer, it depends. Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> let, let me say something about uh, GDP and CO2 emissions. I, I totally agree with Roger. We have the wrong set of incentives. And this is goes back to what Roger said that, what is measured is what is managed. I mean, I, I think that that's more or less what, uh, I, I don't remember exactly if, is, if that's the way he said it, but if you only measure GDP, guess what? We are going to only manage GDP. <laughs> so it's just super simple, put a carbon tax. I mean, in fact, we need research to understand, uh, can we actually just with a carbon tax then make the CO2 emissions then be, you know, a, a revenue relevant, done. So, so, in there are some aspects here that that it might not be the perfect solution, but it's, it's approximating to a solution. I mean, continue hoping for firms to pay attention to something we don't understand. It's just impossible. And then, you know, what is a scope three? They don't even know what a scope three is. They don't even know what the definition is. It's a disaster. You just put a carbon tax. Stop this madness. You just <laughs> so then. You know, people are always thinking that we need to reinvent capitalism because somehow the firms are not paying attention to the things that we value. You know what? Just make them make them material. It's just super simple. Make those issues that are important to society, make them material. Find a way in such a way that the externalities are internalized. We know that since 1920, my friends, 1920 was when Pigou wrote that. So we have a hundred years that we know how to do this. We just can't get our act together. So my view is simple. If you think that something is important, find a creative way to make it actually material. And then Roger's life will be super simple. Well, not super simple, it will be simpler. Let me put it that way. <laughs> so nothing becomes super simple, but at least it will become simpler. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got, a, a, before we get to the wrap up, I got one final question, which I'm gonna basically go through, ask you all to answer from your own perspective, and uh, we'll start with Gervin so you know it's coming. Uh, and that is, you know, given what we've been talking about, do we, re do we need regulation to move the, the ball forward here, to, mo to move the dial? And if so, just very briefly, what form should that take and what authoritative body should be the source of that regulation? So my perspective is a regulation user, eh? so the data. So that starts from, consensus from investors what is important but i think the conclusion one of the conclusions of today is that there is hardly any consensus on what's important have we discussed the 64 different dimensions but in some way somebody needs to set the priorities and it's two ways so either we just assign a regulator and say you choose we 
or, or we assign the government, or we ask the pension funds or other asset owners to set their own preferences, or we listen to NGOs. But from my perspective, uh, I noticed that a lot of asset owners, they have their own ESG policies. So it's very difficult to get some consensus. So that's why we basically value reliable information that's timely available as most important. And we appreciate if a regulator can impose that on companies that all these numbers get reported. I want to give one illustration of how different investors look at ESG. And that's a recent study by Bernstein. And in that study, they researched the number of ESG indices available to investors. And in that study, they identified 60,000 different ESG benchmarks or indices that are available to investors. So it's not only about the 64 data items, but it's just times 1,000. So it's 60,000 different indices that can be tracked by investors to make responsible and sustainable investments. So also the investment community struggles to give that answer to that. So for me, just a regulator, that would be perfect to give us reliable information. And then we make the best out of it. Just so Roger doesn't always go last, I'm going to ask Roger to come in on this next. Oh, you're very tricky, Robert. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, I'll talk about it from a perspective of should an organisation, uh, would, would you regulate an organisation to disclose their sustainable sustainability report? Uh, I... Uh, I, I'm of the view that we still haven't got the frameworks developed uh, appropriately uh, in that particular area. So it's hard, it's hard to regulate. Now, having said that, the EU is doing a lot of work. The European Commission is doing a lot of work on regulation at the moment around non-financial. Um, you would hope that, uh, that but if you get the right frameworks out there and, and organisations do the right thing, that they get rewarded. Uh, and that's then empirical research questions. Uh, and some of the evidence is there. The, the paper which you referred to before in the Harvard Business Review uh, challenged that and said, yes, that's, that's the research finding. But it's probably that the organisations that are doing the, the right thing are, are probably the better managed organisations anyway. So it might be a reward for better management as distinct from a reward from meeting the, uh, from the claim. Um, the problem of not regulating, of course, is you've got laggards, and these are very important issues. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm probably swinging towards regulation, but we need to have informed research to inform the decision making uh, as to what the form of that regulation would be, uh, and and what the what the outcomes and uh, and outputs. Yeah. Roberto uh, suggested a carbon tax. You know, and you can put a carbon tax on the world. Um, but that requires the world to uh, actually co coordinate their activities. Uh, and they're not very good at those types of activities until it comes very late. So, uh, but we need, we need evidence to help that so that we can make, and the policymakers and the regulators can make better decisions in those regards. So I'm um, swinging towards it, Robert, but we need some more research as to, uh, as to what form of regulation that will take. Yeah, well, for those of us in accounting and auditing, we've heard a lot over the last few years of evidence-driven standard setting and regulation, and this is essentially, I think, what you're saying. Roberto, uh, I think given our time, you're going to get the last word here, so, <laughs> so it's all yours. Uh, yes, so, so uh, I think that we all need uh, to put our part, and regulation plays a very important part of that, so I think that uh, we all need to, to play a role, so... I think regulation by regulators is an important one. Regulation through markets is also a very important one where we can actually create assets and use all the blockchain creativity that we have out there to create property rights and things that are very important that you know somehow externalities are not being internalized. I think financial institutions played an extremely, extremely important role here uh, in enforcing uh, uh, the 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 changes by being active. I, I actually think that uh, and money needs to be super active if we're going to solve this problem. We need to get involved with the companies that are dirty. The 50-50% uh, that Gerben said, hopefully he has a place in the board that he can accelerate uh, that path towards zero. So we need to be very active and finance is and plays an extremely important role there. 
citizens and, and, and customers are ultimately the people that we are serving with this information and the regulator is serving those voters, citizens. So we need to understand what they value. I mean, we cannot continue operating assuming that we know what they, they think and they want. Uh, they seem to be very upset in the world. I mean, in fact, when, when I go around the world and I look at how citizens are reacting, I, I feel that we are kind of failing them, uh, uh, that, that somehow we are producing an outcome that they disagree tremendously with that. So we need the young people to, to be the researchers that guide uh, regulation, that guides finance, that guides uh, the reporting in such a way that it reflects what they value. And finally, I agree with Roger, we need to have international standards. And the question, the research question here is, could Europe impose a carbon tax on anything that is traded in Europe? And will that be enough to curtail uh, 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 the carbon emissions? For example, that would be an example of a carbon tax. That's an extremely important question of research. If we're expecting for whole, the whole world to agree on putting a, a, a unique carbon tax, we will be dead before that happens, for sure. <laughs> so uh, the question, the research question is, can there be some partial uh, uh, policies and will that be effective or not? Can a place like Europe afford that and actually, in some sense, educate the rest of us uh, about what should be the path? I think this is, this is extremely important research that is ahead. I really hope that this conversation has shown you that from the view, point of view of uh, from uh, in the, uh, researchers and practitioners uh, motivates you to think about how you can play a very important role in shifting what we think is, uh, is a bad outcome for the moment. And I, I'm very hopeful that this is going to happen because at MIT I have always a chance to meet young people exactly like you uh, that are dreaming really big that are very ambitious in their objectives and they have the chance to actually affect the way uh, the whole world will behave in the future. So I'm going to, Roberto, I'm going to agree with you on the last comment because we're about to run out of time. But I think the next generation of academics is already primed for these issues. They just need the encouragement, the support, the infrastructure to be able to pursue these issues uh, the way those of us who are older have pursued other issues. And I think uh, there's a lot, there is hope in that sense. So I wanna thank the, 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 the uh, panel, Gerben, Roberto and Roger for taking the time to have this discussion. I think it was excellent. I, uh, if we were live, I'd be calling for a round of applause. So you get my applause. Thank you.